students at this prestigious university. I'd like to thank particularly Professor Obiani, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, for inviting me to deliver this lecture, and Professor Stella Okoyeugu, Head of Department English and Literary Studies, for guiding us through the rules and regulations attendant to such lectures. I thank in particular as well Professor Charles Arize Chukuigwe for the warm welcome into this great institution that is not just a cornucopia of knowledge, but also a symbol of our rich history and a testament to who we are as a people, dramatic and dedicated to designing the future that we desire. This institution has midwived the dreams of many accomplished scientists, innovators, economists, public administrators, creatives, artists and artists, writers and of our efforts to reclaim our identity. You have already begun by opening the halls of this institution to conversations geared towards critical thinking and spurring actions towards the development of our region. And I'm grateful to be here today to contribute to the conversation. History has a way of presenting the same opportunity behoves us to make our decisions deliberately. I have spoken extensively on reclaiming our identity as indeed in the past few years and more specifically in the past few months. It is a subject that is very close to and dear to my heart as a student of history and as one who knows that we are well endowed to create wealth and catalyze innovation nationally and globally. We can only chart a path forward in the politics and development of our Libo against the backdrop of our history and a clear understanding of our current reality. Some parts of this lecture may trigger deep feelings of angst, disagreement, and even displeasure. I find it necessary, however, to be as frank as my name sounds and explore the conversation from a prism of various facts. In this lecture, we will examine the current state of affairs in the Southeast, the subject of Igbo marginalization in Nigeria, and the call for a Nigerian president of Igbo extraction reaching a climax with my perspectives on how we can reclaim our identity and pride. The Southeast in Nigeria today. No region in Nigeria has been spared the insecurity, economic hardship, and pervasive sense of foreboding and hopelessness amongst our populace. The business sector has not been spared, and no meaningful business and economic growth can take place in an atmosphere of uncertainty such as what exists in Nigeria today. But without prejudice to the foregoing, however, I'd like to provide the following brief context based on my personal knowledge and understanding of the Igbo identity, politics, and development. From a contraption of convenience for the colonial masters, we have managed to keep the country from completely disintegrating through the decades of disagreements and a bloody civil war that we are yet to heal from. Steeped in our patched unity and federalism is a fragility proliferated by hate, subtle prejudice, and sometimes unabashed bigotry. With the Igbo being the worst recipients, in the 1983 classic, The Trouble with Nigeria, by Chinua Achebe, he captured this situation thus, and I quote, Nigerians will probably achieve consensus on no other matter than their common resentment of the Igbo. The origin of the national resentment of the Igbo is as old as Nigeria and quite complicated. But it can be summarized thus. The Igbo culture, being receptive to change, individualistic and highly competitive, gave the Igbo man an unquestioned advantage over his compatriots in securing credentials for advancement in Nigeria colonial society, end of quote. 
He continued his thought in the 2021 classic. There was a country, a personal history of Biafra, referencing two key publications from northern and western Nigeria, which cast the Igbo, and I quote, as an assertive group that unfairly dominated every sector of Nigerian society, end of quote. Yet, at no other time in our history have we been as divided as we are, and sadly, at this time, driven by a leadership that should have the responsibility to maintain the unity that we claim is non-negotiable. I was born in Kano. I grew up in Meduguri, Lagos, and Enugu. I speak all the three major languages fluently and have a strong network of friends across geographical, religious, and political party lines. I worked with the president, President Olusegun Abasanjo, one of the most detribalized Nigerians that I know. I worked with great colleagues, men and women from different parts of the country who had one goal, the well-being of every citizen regardless of region, religion, or their roots. I can say categorically that I have never felt my evilness as much as I do under the current administration in Nigeria. We have a president who has been unabashed in his disgust against entire ethnic groups and regions, starting with the infamous statement at the U.S. Institute for Peace in July of 2015 that, and I quote, the constituents, for example, gave him 97% of the vote, cannot, in all honesty, be treated on some issues with constituencies that gave me 5%, end of quote. The constitutional provisions of Section 4, Subsection 3, provides that the federal government shall conduct its affairs in such a way that ensures there shall be no predominance of persons from a few states or from a few ethnic or other sectional groups in that government or in any of its agencies. This provision, enshrined in the Constitution in recognition of the heterogeneous nature of the country and as a potent tool to manage our, our diversity, has been observed in the breach under President Muhammad Buhari of the All Progressive Congress, who found no Southeasterner worthy to lead any of the 10 core security agencies in Nigeria. Currently, we have eight of these from the North, one from the South-South, and one from the South-West. The same breach applies to the appointment of federal ministers, three of the six ministers from the Southeast occupying subordinate roles as ministers of state. The story is the same with the appointments of principal, principals of key parastatals in the country. The distribution of infrastructural projects has been lopsided and questionable at best. In 2020, in justification of the contentious 22.7 billion US dollars, the federal government outlined 34 projects to be financed by the facility, with none of these earmarked for the Southeast region. The National Assembly approved this loan without an interrogation of the individual projects, and while the Southeast will not partake as a beneficiary, we would partake in its repayment. Recently, it was announced that the Eastern Railway project would not be completed as promised due to the unavailability of foreign loans required to fund it. At first, vandalization and insecurity were cited as reasons for the stall in the project. We were not told what was being done to address that concern or if anything was being done at all. Yet, the $1.2 billion Kaduna to Kano and the $1.9 billion Kano to Maradi rail projects are still ongoing in the north despite being plagued by years of the Boko Haram insurgency. Most significant has been the difference in the methods deployed to address the insecurity in the north and the east. The energy expended on the extradition and arrest of Ndamdi Kanu bears a heavy contrast to the leniency with which the Boko Haram insurgency and the herdsmen crisis have been addressed. 
We have also watched with dismay the self-aggrandizing attitude of presidential candidates of the two major political parties in the country. Each has consistently undermined the evil in their actions and statements. Bola Ahmed Tinubu of the All Progressive Grand Alliance completely ignored the East during the pre-primary consultations. On arrival in Enugu for the presidential rally last week, his words betrayed acrimony for the evil. And I quote, nobody will give you any credit. You are working hard. You are sweating now. We want you to sweat well now for this party until you deliver victory. Until Bola Tinubu became the president of Nigeria, we will not give you but a soaked slice of bread, end of quote. Abubakar's blatant statement to his kinsmen in the north in October of 2022. I quote, what the average northerner needs is someone from the north. He doesn't need a Yoruba candidate or an Igbo candidate, end of quote. Now please listen to me very carefully. I have an meaning. Imposes an expectation that leaders must always think beyond the present convenience and expediency for electoral victory and or sectional dominance. The above expectation finds additional context in the words of William Shakespeare, who said that while it is wonderful to have the strength of a giant, it is tyrannous a giant. Contextually, politics is a game of numbers, all right. But it smacks of puerile brinksmanship to fail to recognize and to act on the deep fault lines and the geoethnic sensitivities that exist in our country and amongst our people. I believe that it is in our collective enlightened national interests that leaders across groups must act political arrangements and norms, written and unwritten, which have worked to reinforce national cohesion and progress through, our, through the years. At this point, it's important, to really examine, it's important to really examine how we got here. We are all familiar with this situation, seemingly unable to reach a consensus on issues of common interest with a national reputation for of the often repeated dictum, Ibuenweze, an attribute of our republican nature. To my mind, the cliché has assumed extreme and fatalistic dimensions. Give Ndibo rarely coalesces around a common political advantage of the region's political fragmentation. Pest this play out over the past year of the electioneering season. Demonstrated statesmanship and greater sensitivity to Nigeria's diversity by ensuring representation of Nigeria's various groups in the nation's governance structure. This is starkly different from what we have today. For the incoming administration, there should always be a consideration to give the nation's component groups a sense of inclusion and a sense of belonging. The second dimension from which I would like you to view this is the quality of representation that we have had from representatives in these positions. I invite you to take particular note that over an eight-year period from 1999 to 2007, the Igbo had the position of Senate President, the third highest ranking position in the country. Umunem, let us leave our emotions aside. So apart from the psychological high that an Igbo was number three, or Igbos were number three citizens at various times, what special benefits accrued to the Southeast? Did the region get increased budgetary allocations, improved infrastructure, more appointments, and more employment opportunities? What legacy can be ascribed to eight years of representation at that level? How about the Deputy Senate President position, which an Igbo held for 12 years, the longest ever by any group? What's the legacy from a Southeast perspective? And for me, the essence, the point I'm trying to make, and I'm going to tie it up shortly, is that whilst we feel this sense of marginalization, we should also reflect internally what we have done for ourselves, what our representatives have done 
whether they've been there for themselves or there for the people, the region, and the group that they represent. Take another look at the ministerial portfolios. By all standards, some of these were as pivotal as they were prestigious. Again, I ask, how did we deploy these representative opportunities we had, uh, the, that we had? We had the yam, as our people say, and we had the knife, but we could not cut enough yams for ourselves. Who is to blame for this? I'd like to quote Achebe again. His 1983 book, The Trouble with Nigeria, where he said, there's nothing wrong with the Nigerian climate or air or anything else. The Nigerian problem is the inability, the unwillingness of his leaders to rise to the responsibility, to the challenge of personal example, which is the hallmark of true leadership, end of quote. And so being mindful of the intense competition for resources and the geo-ethnic sensitivities in Nigeria, which I alluded to earlier, does the region have the moral authority to lament neglect and marginalization if its own representatives are unable to meet its expectations? In any case, how have we fared in each of the states in the Southeast in which there is homogeneity in language, traditions and norms, and in which our governments have control of state resources? How well have we governed ourselves? What is the state of the economy in these states? Our infrastructure, our roads, our schools, and hospitals. How much planning, on, uh, planning goes on in these states? What have we done with our state allocation of approximately 350 billion naira per state in the last eight years? How have we leveraged our comparative advantage of arable lands, beautiful concentric circle, uh, hills, the natural resources, a teeming young population. Just see the people in this room, in this auditorium. Just see the young people here, the talents, the skills, the, the, the promise that this audience holds. All we need to do is to provide the right infrastructure, provide the right inspiration, provide the right faculty, provide the right incentives and encouragement for everyone here to realize their purpose, to achieve their purpose in life, and to help this region to really be the best region in our country. The foregoing notwithstanding, let me state without equivocation that the policy of exclusion of regions from strategic appointments for not voting for a particular candidate is uh, dangerous, it is divisive, it is unstatesmanlike, it's impolitic, it is undesirable and unhealthy for national cohesion and unity. Considering the above, and while it is a factor, exclusion in mainstream governance is only a fraction of the cost of our current regional predicament. I therefore propose that we can either continue to lay blame or wake up to realize that no one will build a table for us to sit at the head. We must take responsibility for our choices and be pragmatic about them. I will now proceed to discuss the questions of a uh, president of Igbo extraction and agitations for secession. The actions of non-state actors agitating for a sovereign state of Biafra have intensified tensions and insecurity in the region. While a commentator like Dr. Chide Amuta believes that the weaponization of the group for political gains by a few Igbo is a tactical blunder, I'd like to take a more rounded view and ask, are these agitations without a cause? I will borrow the words of Bishop Matthew Kuka in response to Dr. Amuta, and I quote, I agree that the weaponization of Biafra may have long-term consequences, but I am slow to accept the conclusion that it is a tactical blunder that will frighten Nigeria. We have no place, we have to place this in context and not moralize it, Bishop Kuka said. The average Igbo youth today in his 30s or 40s will know that in the last 20 years of our democracy, every section of the country has gotten its president by some threats of spilling blood. He went further to say, this is not an attempt to glamorize violence, but let us be truthful in the face of staggering evidence. Odua People's Congress, OPC, in its raw form, frightened the rest of the country after June 12th. 
and he took this into the elections of 1999. They can claim, Bishop Cook has said, that they got a rubber man for president for what it is worth. The Joy Youth can also claim to have frightened the rest of Nigeria by blowing up pipelines before they received their son, President Jonathan, as a concession of sorts. Similarly, elements of Boko Haram, in whatever shape or form, the killer men and women running riot in the country and murdering thousands of innocent citizens, despite having been paid off, can claim credit for pursuing an agenda in which fear is an investment. Speaking further, Bishop Kuka opined that threats of blood for monkey and baboon were allowed in 2011. The real disease has been spread by the brutal politics of the other segments of Nigeria that inadvertently made violence the commodity of exchange for the presidency. The Biafran agitators, he suggested, as a symptom, not a disease. He went further to say, we can only reverse this ugly scenario if we are honest enough to accept that what we have as politics in Nigeria is blood and banditry by another name, end of quote. The evidence points to the efficacy of violence to deliver political gains for the regions in the country. But evidence also shows that the negative human and economic impacts are far-reaching for all Nigerians. To the Biafran agitators who have in the quest for a better way of life for Alibo, taken to arms, violence, and the imposition of a compulsory sit-at-home order every Monday, I cannot tell you that your agitation is unreasonable or unfounded. My submission above have shown that there is a cause. Yet, I will implore you to consider the following. One, the effects of the war that ensued from the first attempt to secede from Nigeria can only be described as a tragedy of immense proportions. It was devastating to lose almost two million lives with many unaccounted for. We had millions of young children starved to death and tens of thousands more who were airlifted out of the country and never reconnected to their roots. It was devastating to our values and way of life. It was dev devastating for the progress we had begun to make in our economy and with innovative solutions. Many lost their morale for living, earthly possessions, and everything that signified an iota of pride as individuals. The aftermath of the war still lingers just as much as the cause shared above. Thus, we must be pragmatic, sensitive, and wise in ensuring that we do not incur a cost that many will repay for another lifetime. Number two, the effects of your agitation today are not felt by those who govern us, nor are they persuasive enough to make the majority see a reason to support secession. Instead, the poor are getting poorer, being battered fear. The Southeast bleeds profusely every Monday that local businesses, schools, hospitals, and institutions are closed. Our people fear outsiders as much as they fear, uh, they, they, as much as they fear of their own people. This is not right. In research carried out by the International Center for Investigative Reporting, it was reported that the South every day that is every day, and traders have power. Salaries are dropping faster as, employ as employers no longer make satisfactory sales. Out-of-state buyers have also turned to alternative that they will eventually see you as the enemy. What is the quality of leadership that will take over the reins of administration should a referendum be granted and the new entity demanded with intense passion become a reality? Will it be one raised on violence and threats, as those are the tools you operate with now? Will it be one where your governors and representatives across the board do not care to uphold their promises to you? In the bind, I implore you to reconsider the motives and the strength of your pursuit. I speak to you as one that is unhappy with the current system and want to see a change, that we sit down and reevaluate our methods.
our goals and our values. I said earlier that I have never felt more much ever noted in the trouble with Nigeria. All we need is the right leadership. It will be on the path to glory again. I base my firm belief on our history and the success we recorded when we had visionary and selfless leaders. Therefore, our attention must be on instituting a leadership structure that can be trusted and deliver the dividends of democracy to our region. On this note, I will return to the question of a Nigerian president from the Southeast. If it becomes a reality in 2023, the quest for a Nigerian president from the Southeast will be a dream come true for many of us. It will break the deepening sense of alienation and begin to reinstate a sense of belonging. As Farouk Kwerogi deftly captured in his April 2022 article titled, Why Nigeria Needs to Elect an Igbo President in 2023, I quote, you first need to have a country before you can dominate it politically. You first need to have a country before you can dominate it politically. And you can't have a country if a huge segment of it is forced to expend energy trying to get out of it because it doesn't feel welcome. Electing an Igbo person as president is merely a symbolic gesture, but it inspires a sense of inclusion in the minds of many people from that region. It serves as a symbolic conduit through which people vicariously connect with the government and with the country. Electing an Igbo person as president is, first of all, an end in itself before it is a means to an end. End of quote. I will also add that beyond mere symbolism, Igbo leadership has produced some of the most advanced development in the country, as I will highlight in the next few sections of my lecture. The tenacity, innovation, and republican nature of an Igbo president will be the most beneficial to Nigeria at this time in our history. The recent surge from Nigerians across ethnic and religious lines towards a presidential candidate of Igbo extraction is something to note and be hopeful about. More Nigerians, particularly young people, are beginning to see through the roots of bigotry and tribalism engineered by a few political elites. The average Nigerian is only interested in good leadership and economic progress. It does not matter that the person who, del who delivers it does not speak the same language. We must then address whether we will continue to be puppets in the hands of these politicians who have no scruples. However, we must also ask honest questions and prepare for the realities of what could happen after February 25th. If the Southeast does not produce the next president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, have we considered what must be done to ensure our region's political stability, security, and economic prosperity? Also, a bigger question, if the Southeast does produce the next president, will that serve as a panacea for all the challenges we currently face as a people? The answers to both questions will come down to a need to examine our politics and economy at the sub-national level. Today, Southeast states have an average poverty rate of 49%. It means that out of every 10, five of us, five Southeasterners are poor, and an average unemployment rate of 44.54%. Insecurity is at an unprecedented level, both a symptom and a further cause of the economic failures so far. Our roads, both state and federal, have become death traps and our young people are either leaving the homeland or turning to vices for, from frustration and the absence of a clear vision. Those that remain and exert their energy in the right places are daily frustrated by the operating, very difficult operating environment within their states. And so whilst a president of Igbo extraction may give leaders at the subnational level some respite, and perhaps an easier channel of communicating state needs to the federal level. But we cannot deny 
that a larger percentage of the problems we face stem from the leadership crisis that we experience in the Southeast. That's the truth. I'm now going to talk about our past glory. And I'm particularly privileged to have this opportunity because of the young people here. Given the fact that history was removed from the curriculum of schools for several years. And so not many of our people actually understand where we are coming from as a people, as an evil. So where we find ourselves today is in stark contrast to what we were once known for the fastest growing economy in the world. According to a study by the Michigan State University at the time, we had a glorious past that underscored the latent capacity of the Igbo as builders and innovators as much as the quality of leadership that catalyzed the transformative economic growth in the then Eastern region before the devastating effects of coups, the pogrom, and eventually a full-blown war. We lost our pride, our collective vision, the prioritization of our collective progress, our drive for innovation and industrialization, and most importantly, a value-based and selfless leadership. And I speak of the time of a man I consider the most transformational leader that the East has ever produced, the venerable Dr. Michael Obara. As I noted at the start of this lecture, it is critical that we have a firm grasp of the things that we lost and our current reality to enable us to chart a course towards a future that works for us. So who was Michael Obara? And I ask these for the particular benefit of the young people in this room again. And considering that the study of history has been off the curriculum of our schools for several years now, thankfully, the federal government, as if by a stroke of magic, announced the reinstatement of history into our school curriculum. The reason for its initial removal continues to confound me. What do you know about this icon and servant of the, Eastern, of the people of Eastern Nigeria beyond the statutes you have in Enugu and Omaha? Dr. Michael Obara was premier of the Eastern region from 1959 to 1966 under the, under the party called NCNC. Based on recent historical accounts, Dr. Michael Obara remains one of the most outstanding Igbo leaders of the 20th century. In a lecture delivered in Abuja on February 26, 2014, excerpts of which I have taken verbatim below, Professor Anya O. Anya described the period of Obara's stewardship of Eastern Nigeria as the golden age of Nigeria's development. According to him, by 1964, five years after Obara's ascendancy to the premiership of Eastern Nigeria, as recorded by a research group in Michigan State University in the USA, was the fastest growing and industrializing economy in the world. This region was ahead of Malaysia. This region was ahead of Korea. This region was ahead of Taiwan. This region was ahead of Singapore. But how did this happen? It was a culmination of Opara's unique vision in which agriculture and industrial development were the twin pillars on which he built the Eastern Nigerian economy. In agriculture, his plans had a twofold thrust. The development of farm settlements as the anchor for food crops such as rice and poultry development, as well as the establishment of estates of oil palm, cocoa, cashew, which were processed for export. Alongside the agricultural projects, were numerous industrial projects scattered over the length and breadth of eastern Nigeria. And so, in one frenetic burst of energy, a wave of maniacal and development initiatives was ongoing all over eastern Nigeria. As a book on Dr. Abara reminds us, by January 25, 1963, the Michelin factory at Port Harcourt was opened. The tire factory was at that time a three million dollars u.s undertaking this was january 25 1963 on march 22 of the same year the headquarters building of the universal insurance company was opened in enugu on may 10 the nigerian gas factory was commissioned in mnn near enugu on may 16 the aluminum factory at port Harcourt was opened 
On August 24, the glass factory became operative in Port Harcourt. On October 18, the asbestos cement factory was opened in MNN. On November 9, the foundation of the Central Bank was laid in Port Harcourt. On November 30, the Golden Guinea Breweries was commissioned at Umahia for the production of lager beer and allied products. On December 13, Hotel Presidential was opened at a whopping cost of two, uh, two million uh, British pounds. The burning fire for industrialization led to the establishment of this modern ceramic industry in Umahia, textile mills in Aba and Onisha, and a shoe factory in Oweri. In one year, There was a catalog of numerous small industries that were also established simultaneously with the major ones during this period. It was during this period that the first phase of the farm settlement scheme was established. Ulona in Umahia province, Ohaji in Oweri province, Ibariam in Onisha province, Boki in Ogoja province, Uzuwani in Enugu province, Abak in Anang, in Anang province. Each was to accommodate over 5,000 farmers. And what was remarkable was the scrupulous effort for an even spread of the settlements throughout the length and breadth of the eastern region. All of these activities had been elaborated in his vision for development of the region after the general elections of 1961. And as he stated, I quote, the period immediately, the election, uh, the period immediately following the election was a period for building the economic consciousness of the people. It is this consciousness and burning desire to raise the standard of living of our people, the unflinching determination to assault poverty from our fronts that has been distilled into the 1962 to the 1968 development plan. He went on and said, inviting the people as citizens of a democratic region to examine, to approve, to criticize or condemn any portion of the plan the plan is the people's plan. It provides for the development of a small village. It touches on the requirements of the largest city. It caters to the need of the smallest peasant industry and prescribes the means for the mounting of the biggest industries. What was remarkable, ladies and gentlemen, in his vision was the appreciation of the role of the private sector. As he observed, to achieve rapid economic growth, and raise the standard of living of the people, it was necessary that the private citizens, the ordinary men and women everywhere, must participate by taking a fair and equitable share in our development and industrial projects. He went on to elaborate on his vision when he stated, in encouraging and participating in the industries established in the region, our government was doing so on behalf of the citizens of the region. It was, as it were, holding its shares on trust for the people. As and when the industries have overcome their teaching problems and the risk of failures minimized, the government proposes to divest itself of most of its shares and the money realized used in pioneering into new projects. This visionary, ladies and gentlemen, did not only recognize the role of the government as a steward on behalf of the people, but more importantly, he acknowledged the government's fiduciary responsibility. It was an incredible display of courage amid rampaging risk factors and the energy to pursue long-term goals on behalf of the people. It was a remarkable demonstration of transparency and accountability. It was a vision that was 40 years ahead of its time. These latter values were illustrated by his commitment to participatory democracy as shown in the fact that he inaugurated an annual series of leaders of thought conferences, a total of five, in 1960, 1962, 1963, and 1965. A remarkable aspect of his industrialization plan was the collaboration and cooperation with foreign investors to undertake large industries, such as Michelin Tire Factory in Port Harcourt and in Calago Cement Factory in present day Ebon State. Indeed, in Opera's long-term vision, was the Port Harcourt through Aba, was that Port Harcourt through Aba and Umahia going on to Enugu would have developed into a globally significant industrial megapolis and conurbation. This drove the passion for the development of this great institution of the University of Nigeria, for which some people believe he has not been given adequate credit. 
He provided the money through his prudent management of the resources of the region. If the politics of those times had been better managed, Eastern Nigeria would have been ahead of South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. For we were indeed ahead of these success stories of the second half of the 20th century. But what was even more remarkable was his spirit characterized by this arming humility and rock-solid determination to confront all odds frontally. These were exemplified by his return to medical school after the war. We cannot end this without recognizing the unique strategies he adopted in the management of the government and the instruments he adopted for far-reaching economic programs. For the latter, the Eastern Nigeria Development Corporation, ENDC, was the engine room for the pursuit of his economic development plans. His management of men and resources was imaginative, innovative, and revolutionary. The most remarkable attribute is that after his stint as Premier of Eastern Region, Eastern Nigeria, he returned to live in his father's modest bungalow, even as some members of his cabinet had vast estates in their hometowns and elsewhere. Friends and associates eventually took up a collection to build him a house in his village in 1979. That speaks volume of Dr. Michael Obara's integrity as a public servant. <laughs> he had arrowheads who coordinated the activities of government in addition to the informal agencies of democratic participation. He ceded the day-to-day -day running of the party to his old friend, Dr. Elsie Mbanugo. He ceded the civil service to uh, uh, Sam Oti the intelligentsia to Professor Carlo Ezera, and the economic domain to Sir Louis Odumegu Ojuku. These were members of his kitchen cabinet, as it were, and beyond the formal structures of the party and the bureaucracy. Thus, he could exercise an inspiring overview to the business of governance through the formal structures of governance, even as he recognized the validity of the informal networks that are the eyes and could invigorate governance. In the final analysis, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Obara's success ultimately rested on his understanding of his people and the operative environment that had shaped him and his people. He certainly deserves intense study if we are ever going to appreciate where the rain started to beat us, as we say, given our present circumstances. This brief account of the Obara years is a wistful reminder of what Nigeria could have been. Nevertheless, the vision must survive. The vision must endure. And that is why some of us have stepped and thrown our hearts into the ring. <clears throat> Dr. Obara's achievement as Premier were not happenstance. It was not an accident. The quality and flawless execution of his plans suggested that he came to the government with a purpose. His personality, overall comportment and achievement suggest a deep consciousness about his reason for being. Michael Obara's success exemplifies for us what good leadership should be and how it is delivered. He clearly had a vision which matched the task at hand. He organized to get the right people and empowered them to join the effort. And he deployed his organizational skills to ensure that the actions of his government and the people working with him were consistent with the vision and the mission and were effective in delivering the desired results for the people of Eastern Nigeria. Then the war came. The war came, bringing carnage to lives properties and a culture of innovation and accelerated economic development. Yet, even during the destruction, the brilliance of our minds still sparkled. And that's exactly what Mr. Vice Chancellor referenced when he spoke. I hadn't read much, I must confess, about his time in government. When I made the following submissions during the 2014 National Conference in Abuja, and I quote, Nigeria cannot develop by accident. No nation has and can develop by accident. The old and the new civilizations that we, inspire, that we aspire to be like were not built by accident. They were not built by mediocrity. 
Kleptomaniacs did not build them. Ethnic and religious irredentists did not build them. Visionaries who were disciplined built them. They were built through a conscious and deliberate and dedicated effort, anchored on a deep commitment to the welfare and the well-being of their people and their place in the world. These nations have continued to make progress for the exact same considerations today. I would like, therefore, from this podium to challenge the leaders and all of our people that what we need and what we must demand and what all of us must work for is another Michael Obara moment. As Pius or Kibo aptly described him in his 1987 treatise, Obaranomics, the economic and social philosophy of Michael Obara, he was a man clearly ahead of his time. He said he was clearly ahead of his time, that is local time, in his dedication to political honesty, in his passion for truth, and in his dedication to pro public probity. His efforts to modernize the oil, palm, rural economy of the East had all the ingredients of a major revival, but it lacked the institutional infrastructure to guarantee its success. It is this that gives the present campaign by the present military government a greater chance of success. That's the time he was writing. It was still military government. I'm quoting him directly. He was ahead of his time in a second respect. Contrary to the received wisdom of his contemporaries, he passionately believed in man. He passionately believed in man as being the center of development. He was therefore not much concerned ostensibly, not at all intimidated by economic and financial ratios, quotients and factors. Finally, he was ahead of his time in a third and most important sense. He was simultaneously a genuinely dedicated leader of a multi-ethnic region of which his own ethnic group was a large part and a passionately true Nigerian while most of his counterparts at the time were only part-time Nigerians and full-time leaders of their tribe. It is this, he said, that makes Michael Obara that unique and exceptional Nigerian leader. He expressed in clear and uncompromising terms the yearnings and aspirations of the average Nigerian. He was, in Bagehot's apt definition of a leader, a common man of uncommon principles. We need the rebirth of vision and courage, determination and industry, ambition and success to create an Aladimma worthy of the potential that the Almighty has so generously blessed our people with. The final part of my lecture is dedicated to the journey to reclaiming our identity. The need for a common vision. As I reflected on my presentation today, I recalled what may be considered a historical parallel to the current experience of the Igbo, and I seek your indulgence to share a brief history with you. In the 1999 elections, chiefs Olusegun Obasanjo and Olufalai both Yoruba were front runners for the PDP and the Alliance for Democracy, respectively. Through PDP's of Bas uh, though PDP's of Basanjo won the elections, the AD, the Alliance for Democracy, won the six southeast states of Lagos, Ogun, Oyo, Ekiti, Odo, Ondo, and Oshun. The PDP subsequently won five out of the six states in the two, uh, 20, uh, 2003 elections, except for Lagos. In 2007, the ACN won Lagos and subsequently Ekiti and Oshun in 2010 from staggered elections. PDP had Ogun and Ondo states during the same period before the Labour Party took Ondo state in 2009. Oshun reverted to Action Congress, AC, following a court ruling. But you will recall, ladies and gentlemen, that between 1999 and 2007, the AD and the AC had a running battle with the ruling PDP, federal government. And like the Southeast's current experience, budgetary allocations to the region were limited, while statutory allocations to, some, to local government councils in Lagos State became a subject of litigation and were withheld for several years. Though the region's mainstream political elites remained in opposition 
during 1999 to 2015, when the PDP was in power at the center, they got more than their fair share of appointments. A strategy adopted by the PDP to gain political support from the region. Now, what is the lesson here? The lesson for me is the principal tenacity of the Yoruba political class. They are steadfast opposition to the ruling PDP and the equanimity with which they bore their plight. But most importantly, their historic comeback in 2015 through the instrument of a strategic alliance with Northern Nigeria, positioning the region as their preferred strategic political partner to the exclusion of the Southeast from mainstream governance at the federal level since 2015. It is clear, ladies and gentlemen, from the foregoing, that the fringe position of the Yoruba from 1999 to 2015 was based on choice, and they took responsibility for these choices. During the same period, the Igbo also made their own choices. The consistency of these choices appears to suggest that it may be anchored on some deeply held egalitarian political values and beliefs. But as we can see, why one group had taken full responsibility for their own choices, following what I, you know, Newtonian principles, for every reaction there's an equal and opposite, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, the other appears to want to eat their cake and still have it. In the bye. Kedusin, eh? My position is that Igbo must take full responsibility for the political choices that we have made. Ayada Sosa. It is not in our culture to sit down and salivate over the aroma of food emanating from across the fence of your neighbor. Aina Bambo. But what are the lessons for the Igbo from what I just shared with you? The additional lessons that the Igbo political class can learn from the Yoruba experience are what? Cohesion, unity, clarity of vision, patience, dignity, tenacity, mobilization, accommodation, and most importantly, contentment. They were in the political trenches for 16 years or so to speak. Still, they persevered, coming together when they needed to and disagreeing when they had to for the ultimate and overall benefit of their region. I cannot fail to point out the influence of the Yoruba patriarchal system on the politics of the region and how they deploy the expertise of their intelligentsia and the influence of their sociocultural groups made up of their elders and who enjoy the recognition and consultative patronage of a ruling political elite. We can, in the same way, turn our acephalous system into an advantage having a common goal and a body of elders who are trusted to provide guidance. And how the Yoruba, Yorubas walk their way to political reckoning is not novel, as shown in the example of Obara's exploits. Still, it suffices to say that it holds significant lessons for Igbo political elite, the region's intelligentsia, and important cultural organs which have played major roles in Igbo thought, leadership, and ascendancy in the past. So rather than moan under the weight of despondency that is pervasive in the Southeast today, the region must see its current political dilemma as a great opportunity for introspection and mobilization for the resurgence of Igbo thought leadership that will frame the challenges before us and convert strategic engagement options for survival under the prevalent circumstances. The Igbo Renaissance will require a pan-Igbo effort involving the participation of all segments of our population in a formalized structure. The political office does not necessarily confer wisdom. And I hold a strong view that co-opting the region's intelligentsia and sociocultural groups, including faith institutions, to generate ideas as well as act on, as sounding boards for public policy options will have positive outcomes. What the political elites were able to demonstrate is that leadership is not always necessary to be exercised at the individual level. The key to Yoruba success has been the triumph of collective leadership, whereby individual members of the elite were able to, or motivated by their, act, by their visions of enlightened collective self-interest, to subsume their personal ambition or temptations for instant grat gratification for a much bigger price for their region, if patience and wisdom could be brought to their predicament. The Southwest has even gone further to formalize these practices and structures by establishing the development agenda 
for Western Nigeria called the Dawn Commission, under which they have coalesced, irrespective of political differences, and built consensus on the strategic development needs of the Southwest. In the words of an astute, uh, of, oh my God, in the words of an astute scholar, Dr. Okechukwu Ikejiani, this Igbo formalized structure will be, I quote, an institution in itself, he said, the body must be greater than individual groups or individuals. It will be capable of maintaining and repairing itself. It will have a life of its own which must be longer than the life of its individual uh, uh, personalities. It must include all Igbos within Nigeria and diaspora. It must have a permanent arm through which it can carry out its missions. And above all, while some of its characteristics will not facilitate overt action, the main and central machinery of the structure must remain closely guided. Today, we have Ohaneze, the foremost pan Igbo sociocultural group. But I am unaware of any other sociocultural group that, are co that, have, that have constantly faced the kind of challenge that this group faced daily, internally and externally. We must revisit our drawing board and craft a plan on how to reach a consensus on issues of common interest and sacrifice political mercantilism for our collective uh, group interest. We must also, you know, begin to appreciate some of our history. You know, where we are coming from, who we are as a people. And um, I am particularly intrigued by the pride of the average northerner, for instance, even when confronted with the stark reality of the internal differences, economic and security situation. And Bishop Kuka made a note on this. He said, and I quote, the North unraveled a long time ago, and what is left is a scarecrow that still frightens some ignorant people in the South, end of quote. This is a, a Northerner from Southern Kaduna telling you that where he comes from, what you think exists does not exist. Yet, yet, the man from the North is proud of where he is from, and we lay claim to leadership as if it were a birthright. Dr. Hakim Baba Ahmed, Northern Elders Forum Director of Publicity and Advocacy, in September 2021 said, and I quote, we will lead Nigeria the way we have led Nigeria before. Whether we are president or vice president, we will lead Nigeria. We have the majority of the votes, and democracy says, vote whom you want. Why does anybody need to threaten us and intimidate us, he asked. We will get that power, but be humble because power comes from God. We inherited leadership, and being honest is not being stupid. We may not have the most robust economy, but the North has pride. We are humble enough to know that we are going to run Nigeria with other people, but we are not going to play second fiddle to anybody, end of quote. How many of you in this auditorium this afternoon pay attention to these issues and relate them to the conduct and management of leadership of our public affairs? The entitlement may be off-putting, but the sense of pride and identity is unmissable. We must therefore intentionally restore our pride by embracing our history. And I have taken the time to do a constant reminder of the strides of our heroes past and their commitment to a set value system is required to begin reshaping the mindsets of our people and raising a new breed of leaders. I particularly like the introductory passage to the Center for Igbo Studies here in Onsuka, as captured by Dr. Wanko Mwezigwe. And I quote, there has also been the attempt by some scholars of Igbo language to equate the subject of Igbo studies only in the context of Igbo language studies. But the fact remains, he said, that any proper study of any group of people like the Igbo must not only be holistic in structure, but should be dynamic. The Igbo, as a people, ethnically defined today, face diverse challenges which require instinctive, audacious, creative, and where necessary, pragmatic solutions. The Igbo have played and continue to play central roles in economic, political, religious, cultural, and social trends in the Nigerian state, as well as on the international landscape. Instinctively, 
global in their pattern of economic enterprise, yet curiously attached to the fundamental basis of their identity and value orientation. The Igbo presents an enigma of an African personality whose presence in any socioeconomic, political, or religious setting often evokes reverberating, uh, reverberating effects. Studying the Igbo experience thus provides an invaluable window into the fascinating evolution of a people so defamed, misunderstood, unappreciated, besieged, viewed with domineering suspicion, and most tragically, subjected to all kinds of uncanny descriptions and attacks by their hosts and neighbors alike, yet remain adored by some as agents of positive change and sources of inspiration, end of quote. You can see, in a way, in a way, you're even, you're even reluctant to acknowledge who you are. We're even reluctant to applaud yourselves. That's it. There is power in knowing and understanding our innate strengths and what we achieved with it before personal survival and materialism eroded our values. In the same way, we must ensure that our people understand our current realities and deliberately groom the rising political and economic consciousness in our people. This is where, in my view, we must take advantage of the talents that are bound in the Southeast. We must leverage the arts, writing, visual arts, filmmaking, music, and theater to drive the mass scale reorientation of our people. Storytelling should once again become infused into our social and family life. We must do as God said to the Israelites in Psalms and Deuteronomy to, and I quote, impress our story on our children. Talk about them when we sit at home and when we walk along the road, when we lie down and when we get up. This way, they will not forget and derail from the path that we want our region to go. So as we go down memory lane, the revival of our values must be one of the core things we prioritize. A scholar and former senior lecturer at the University of Nigeria, Elizabeth Isiche, made this observation years ago, and it still rings through today. She said, and I quote, since the war, the Igbo traditionally strong communal ties have been partially broken and replaced with a greater materialism, a greater cynicism. End of quote. I hold a firm view that we cannot reclaim our lost glory without a return to the cultural values and the egalitarian principles on which Igbo society was founded. Omenala. Culture. Today, even our language for a lot of Igbo families has become a sign of civilization that the children don't speak the language. No, how does, how does Igbo? <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't think of anything more disastrous. That is the greatest way to lose your identity. That is it. So we must go back to these principles. Omenala, our culture. Nsopuru, respect. Nso, abomination, sanctity. Uchu, perseverance. Ibambo, hard work. Igwebike, strength in unity. Onyanga, na one year. Shared prosperity. And because of our egalitarian disposition, live and let's live. Leave the other part of it. I don't want anybody's arm getting broken. Live and let's live. We can coexist. We can be our brother's keeper. We can create shared prosperity. All of these values promoted order promoted love, respect, morality, responsibility, mentorship, cohesion, and unity as foundations for group progress. There existed robust deterrence and sanctions regimes, which encouraged adherence. Now, the words of Dr. Daniel Patrick Monihan, as quoted in Culture Matters by Samuel Huntington, 
capture the place of culture in human affairs. And I quote, the central conservative truth is that it is culture, not politics, that determines the success of a society. The central liberal truth is that politics can change a culture and save it from itself. End of quote. So several reasons have been adduced for the erosion of these Igbo values, including the fact that there has been a tragic disconnect between generations in Igbo land. My entire life, and whatever I have made of it, till now, have been largely shaped by the influence of my immediate family and extended family, and largely constitute my own manual for fatherhood and parenting today. It is what I was taught that I now teach my children in the context of the 21st century. And so as minister, I had a father who would write me letters, telling me how proud he was, but reminding me that in the event that I should get in, uh, involved in any scandal, anything that dragged the family name to disrepute, that he would disown me. He did that. I was a federal minister. And because we were so close, and I used to tease him a lot, once I said to him, well, Igwe, you know, you're speaking to a federal minister. He did not hesitate. He said, well, you're speaking to the father of a federal minister. That was my father for you. So many might argue that times have changed. Yet, I contend that the values of hard work, honesty, respect, responsibility, fortitude, perseverance, and integrity, these are universal. These are eternal. They will never go out of fashion. No matter how much you try to deride these values, no matter how much you pretend that they don't matter, these values are universal, and I insist they are eternal. It was these values that drove Michael Okwara and his team, leading to rapid economic advancement in the eastern region. In the late 50s and early 60s, we can do the same today if we are deliberate and committed to transforming Igbo land. And it is for the preceding reason that I appreciate the work of the Center for Igbo Studies here in Usuka and organizations such as the Center for Memories for the commitment to serve as a bridge between the present, within the, uh, bridge between the past and the present, and then of course as a link to the future. I do not doubt that the Igbo nation is the better for it. It is my view that the governments of the Southeast should take interest in what the Center for Memory stands for and is doing and make a commitment to a permanent memorial for the experiences of our people during the war and as a significant step towards commencement of healing within the region. Leveraging our history as creators, builders, and innovators. As we embark on this journey of cultural rediscovery, we must leverage our history as builders and innovators. We must return to what I call first principles, to, inter to interrogate and rediscover our identity. Who are we? What are we known for? What factors have converged to erode our identity and cultural values in the way they have become eroded today? How and why have we come from the positions of leadership and preeminence in academia, medicine, science, history, and politics that are forebears earned by merit to the positions of underdogs, maligned, humiliated, despised, and literally begging for our lives. But let me remind us that Igbos are a courageous and resilient people. We are warriors. Above all, the Igbos are a people steeped in their veneration of justice. We believe that actions have consequences and that leadership imposes on the leader the obligation to rule, guide, and influence the people justly, courageously, and with visible results in the improvement of the well-being of, of all society. Our history is also replete with acts of heroism by our forebears as they fought for their dignity at various times. The sculptured work of men breaking free from chains mounted at Rangers Avenue roundabout and Root Government House Enugu is a memorial for kind, uh, uh, coal miners massacred by the colonialists at Hiva Valley coal mines in 1949 while protesting poor working conditions. You may have read about the Abba Women's Rebellion in 1929 over the introduction of taxes for women. But you may not have heard about the scope and impact of that resistance across the length and breadth of the eastern region, which cover the current southeast and south-south geopolitical zones. And I urge 
you all to take interest in history, especially Igbo history. I find it fascinating. There are also copious historical accounts of the heroic acts undertaken by Igbo slaves to die in dignity, such as the 1773 mass suicide above, uh, aboard a slave ship, New Britannia. You may also know that the exploits of uh, uh, Oluada Equino, an enslaved Igbo who became the first slave to buy his freedom, he subsequently campaigned for the abolition of slavery. And there are many more. We're innovators and builders, and our fathers before us, their heirs and successors, continue to record many firsts in multiple feats of endeavor. People like uh, late Professor Kenneth Dike, people like Professor Chico Obi, Professor Frank Ndili, Professor Philippe Magwali, Dr. Pius Okibo, Professor Chino Achebe, Professor Cipher Nequency, and more recently, people like Chimamande Adichie, even uh, uh, Austin J.J. Okocha, Professor James Wonya Adichie, Professor uh, um, Ada Priscilla and Zemiro, and on and on and on. There are so many who are here. But these are evil men of, and women of note, of repute, of achievement. People who not just are celebrated nationally, but are also celebrated globally. We must also leverage the gift we have as entrepreneurs. I want to draw attention to the primacy of the private sector in our development, especially in a market-driven economy like Nigeria. And my position is rooted in the acephalous nature of Igbo society and its amenability to only subtle political control. The Igbo take their destinies into their hands rather than wait for help from other quarters, unafraid to chart new courses and explore new territories. The Igbos are the most adventurous and the most widely traveled of all Nigeria's ethnic groups. It is therefore no wonder that Igbo investment across the country is reported to be higher than Nigeria's GDP, with a total investment in Lagos and Abuja estimated to be 300 trillion and 600 trillion naira, respectively, according to a 2013 report by Vanguard newspapers. I have yet to see a more recent report, but I'm willing to bet that it will be much higher now. And so, as I begin to conclude, I want to quickly suggest that we must take advantage of the Igbo in the diaspora. And I say this because the fate of the Igbo, both within and outside Nigeria, is inextricably intertwined. Our destiny is the same. Let there be no mistakes about it. All the Igbos in the diaspora preoccupy their thoughts within the, unfortunate develop, within, uh, within the unfortunate developments in Nigeria. We must therefore capitalize on the patriotism of our people in the diaspora to seek their full participation in pursuit of the common cause of prosperity for our fatherland. And so, <laughs> thank you. There is, thank you. There is a very stark contrast, you will agree with me, between what happened in the opera years and what we have across the length and breadth of Igbo land today. If you start from Abia, it's a disaster. We go into Imo, it's a disaster. We go on to, uh, we come to Enugu. Well, I leave that to you. We go on to Eboin. There's some semblance of progress there. But you can see the remarkable difference between the Obara years and what we have today. And what is the most responsible for that, for difference, is the leader, the quality of the leadership, the quality of the team, and the people that worked with Dr. Obara. And so he and his team intentionally envisioned a future of influence for our people. They worked to institute good leadership, to establish industries and to build infrastructure. They understood how to deploy political power for economic development and the welfare and the well-being of our people. 
they walked with integrity. They walked with equity and foresight. The world came to see and ask how they did what they did. I dream of a regional coalition and collaboration that serves the common interests of our people. And so there's a very strong connection between providing good governance to our people locally and building a regional power block that will serve our interests nationally. For a clear and present action, we must consider this very seriously as we go into the, as we go into the 2023 elections. My conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. The conclusion. The elections and the next few months are pivotal for Nigeria and Igbo land. Regardless of the results, we will have opportunity to take decisions that will have far-reaching consequences for the future. These decisions have been analyzed and elaborated on by scholars and visionary Igbo leaders through the years, some of which I have cited. These dialogues are, however, not enough, but are essential first steps in the march towards reclaiming our identity. The dialogues have created opportunities for us to share knowledge about our history and contemporary issues. Still, we must go a step further to put our money where our mouth is. No one, no one, I repeat, no one will give us a seat at the table that they have created for themselves. We must therefore be pragmatic to understand that we need to build a strong and influential base that will serve the interests of our people locally and nationally. I close my allocution with this quote by Professor Michael J.C.H. from his 1979 lecture titled, A Matter of Identity. And I quote, the challenge that we all face today is that of reestablishing our identity. As is perhaps evident from my rather oblique presentation of my subject, no simple prescription is being proposed. Only an understanding of our predicament and a willingness to pay the real high price dictated by our circumstances. For centuries, he said, we have been slaves to our own people, unable to shake off tyranny except by radical and costly action. No subtler, more gently modes of redress seem applicable in an environment which has apparently no room for gentleness. For centuries, we have been slaves to other cultures or have been seen as being such slaves. In the various countries to which our brothers and sisters were carried, we labored as other people's slaves. Today, we still labor as if we were slaves to a larger community of peoples. Let us learn from the lessons of this history and resolve to be ourselves again. We have begun well. This was in 1979. Today is January 19, 2023. Our people say, whenever one wakes up, that's his morning. Ndigo, kunienu, 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 kunienu. Thank you so much for your attention. You have been extremely urgent. Thank you. Thank you. Onye were in Yanoro, Onye Marie Yapere, Aquabera Wambe, Lugotto, Tetanora, Pico Cainta Cunianora, Cunian, Tetanora, Enugo Tetanora. Onye were in Yanoro, Onye Marie Yapere, Aquabera Wambe, Lugotto, Tetanora, Enugo Tete, Kaita Tetanora, Tetanora, Enugo Tetanora, Tetanora. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of, round of applause yeah. for our guest lecturer, for the distinguished lecture of the Faculty of Arts. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Wow. Wow. I like the conclusion, the concluding part of it. Beautiful. Not the first one, the sixth concluding part. Yes. I loved it. So beautiful. Thank you, sir. I'd like to invite for a vote of thanks and also the presentation of a word. Okay. 
Wow. Okay, while we get ready for that. All right. Okay, so while they are getting ready and ensuring that we are going to pro progress with that, somebody might win some cash here this afternoon. But what's that? Why not they scream? I pray it's someone that's standing, especially those that have been standing for a while. But I would like you guys to go to open your phone and go on Twitter and tweet what's happening here, tagging our guest lecturer. His Twitter handle is Frank Wenke2. That is I I Frank Wenke I I. You can tweet and tag him. Any tweet that has the most engagement will win a cash prize. And I would have mentioned the amount, but no, because I want to be sure it's only people that really want to tweet that will get it. So, and then the hashtag is also Frank Wenke in UNN. Just let's do that that way. So yes, if you can do that now, let's let's get your friends to like and retweet. Let's tell them that the Faculty of Arts is, ha of Arts is happening right here at the University of Nigeria in Soka. Don't miss out on what's happening. Tell your friends to tell their friends. Now to present the award, I'm going to invite the former Dean Faculty of Arts, uh, our distinguished This award is an excellent leadership award presented to our guest lecturer. And to do that, I'm going to invite the former Dean, Faculty of Arts, Professor Nalugo Okoro. Please put your hands together for him as he goes on with his presentation. Hello, um, distinguished members of the University of Nigeria, more specifically, members of the Faculty of Arts, uh, the University of Nigeria, Faculty of Arts, today, January 19, 2023 is presenting this award that we have titled, aptly titled, Excellent Leadership Award to Frank Mweke Jr. In recognition of his past and continuing service to humanity. May God bless you, sir. Yeah, take the picture. Thank you very much. We noticed that there are lots of all the faculties all the departments at the Faculty of Arts are represented here today and it's a beautiful thing. In a long while this hasn't happened and thanks to the administration of the Dean of Arts, the current Dean, Professor Opiani, and it's a beautiful thing. Let's put our hands together for him once again for this lecture. Thank you, sir, for bringing everybody together. And then the whole event, even though conceived by the administration of the faculty, would have not worked so well if not for the planning, all right? So, and who put this together? They are called the Local Organizing Committee, but there is nothing local about this committee, especially because they have a chairman who happens to be known for those that are not in English and literary studies. 
she, we call her Star Baby. Star Baby. But she's Professor Stella Okoyo. I'm going to invite her right now for the vote of thanks. Please put your hands together for the one and only Star Baby. intellectually stimulating one. I wish to thank the Vice Chancellor for agreeing to host the event. I want to thank the seasoned academics and astute administrators here. I want to thank our students. You are the best. I could see you taking notes somewhere recording the lectures because we actually told you that after the lectures you'll be giving the lecture you'll be giving assignments. Those in mass communication we are asked to report the lecture. Those in English and literary studies we are asked to give a literary critique on the lecture. So many things you were expected to do and you're going to do. I thank you because you are the future we are looking up to. I wish to thank everybody in no particular order who has contributed in making this event a success. And to the Lord God Almighty who has provided today, given us the gift of life and the gift of today and provided divine and heavenly security because indeed the watchman watcheth in vain if the Lord does not guard the city. The event needlessly, I can't overemphasize the fact that it is a huge success and we owe it to God. So my assignment is to thank everybody and I wish to say thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the head, Department of English and Literary Studies, University of Nigeria. Um, now we're going to, I'm going to, I'm supposed to at this point announce for a recession, but I also want to make it clear, really, that's when I said uh, tweet, the one with the highest engagement, I wasn't joking, it's what it is, because they just gave me some money now. So I don't know who is going to have it. But it's just as if I don't need money personally, I do. So just in case no engagement, which I'm thinking might be my prayer now. So thank you guys for coming around. Um, so when we close, feel free to come up here and take pictures with uh, Mr. Frank Mweke Jr. Not everybody. Just feel free. I mean, he's like that. 
you know, that's the, the year, the, when we've, where we've found ourselves. We have people running for office that are available to us. So feel free to come around, take pictures, tell your friends that you met people like that. <laughs> it's very important for you and us and for the future that we are asking for. I'd ask uh, the Department of Music to take us now as we close. So may we all rise for the National Anthem. for coming around today once again i'm your host my name is lorenzo menakaya please music as the recession begins